young, <laughs> uh, slender, uh, very good looking, well spoken. You know, you had a, power, a really powerful command of the English language. He was a, had a great sense of humor. I think the amazing thing is that coming from such a poor background that he made so much of himself. I, it was remarkable. You know, he had this difficult teenage family life with his parents divorcing and he stayed apparently with, with his friends most of the time. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't affect him. He, you, you'd think he'd be sad or depressed or withdrawn or something, not at all. He's be not just an art historian specializing and articulating, making Chinese art accessible to uh, non-Chinese and non-Japanese, and, but then try to make it so uh, intimate that whoever here Jim uh, verbalize Chinese art really wants to know more about it. And he has this nag for ability to uh, make his description of the painting interesting even though the object may not be right, right in front of you, but you become very curious about what he was talking about. It was sort of like a revelation that you could look at paintings almost as you can read a book and his ability to point out those minute details within a painting are part of what was so uh, compelling about his, his way of presenting the material. Jim Cato is put in so much more than 10,000 hours, looking in uh, illustrated books, but more than that, looking at the real things. And a lot of art historians never reached that point. To sit in his classroom was really to be warmed by a fire uh, of somebody who understood art um, at, the, at the deepest levels. He was an art history connoisseur and formalist. He could look at a painting and, and know pretty much right away whether it was worth exploring it any further. So he had a, a really good eye and a fantastic memory. And when he taught, he actually looked at the work. And look at us, he looked at the work and you could see him thinking about it and seeing new things and he pulled you in. Jimmy's not just a person of great learning <clears throat> and uh, articulate scholar in Chinese art and, and uh, uh, able to persuade other people to show interest, but also somebody who knows uh, art from other angles, music, films, opera, you know, and, and, and he can talk anything ab about this subject. Well, I don't know anyone who wrote more, thought more, talked more, showed more um, work to more people, trying to illuminate this field to people who read books, people who go online, people who sit in his classroom, people who studied with him. One of the things he told me that I remember loving, he said, Harvard had this particular uh, painting, Chinese painting, for which they were very proud, and, and, uh, but they didn't know a lot about it, and they asked Jim about it. He knew that this painting was essentially like having uh, the, the uh, pinup of Betty Grable that the uh, 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 Air Force, Army Air Corps used to inspire them or whatever, but it was essentially like the Playboy Playmate of the Month. Uh, and, and apparently, and I don't m mean to say anything uh, as if I'm trying to put down the Harvard faculty in uh, Chinese painting or Asian art or something, but they didn't know it. The Riverbank, yes. So this was a painting that belonged to C.C. Wong, who was a very good friend of Jim, Jim's over many, many decades, and who had a home in New York, but also in San Francisco, so he was often in the Bay Area. They traded paintings and had a great relationship as collectors. So, uh, and Cece, you know, was had the deadest eye in the business. I mean, he could spot a fake at 50 feet easily. And we all felt that about him. Very amusing man and a great artist. In his so um, the big symposium was, you know, held and all, Wen Fang had all of his surrogates arguing why it's a 10th century work. And it got quite nasty, um, really nasty, and because there was a lot of money involved and a lot of reputations at stake. 
And, um, you know, Mr. Cahill uh, stuck to his guns. Sherman Lee said, was I mean, he was in his last legs, and he said he didn't really care what the painting was, but it was a pastiche and it wasn't genuine. It wasn't a genuine painting of that period. So Sherman, and Mark, if Mark had been asked to speak, he would have said the same thing. And I think there may have been a couple of other people there, but um, the overwhelming public opinion, which was uninformed, of course thought the Met and Richard Barnhart could do no wrong. And I don't deny them their freedom to say whatever they want, but not to knock Jim down personally like that. That was really embarrassing. He said if you wanted to fake an old painting but didn't know how it was going to uh, look, um, you would break it up going east, west, and north, south to make it look like it's all cracked. But that's a very, uh, to my mind, that's, uh, and I studied historical techniques when I was in university, uh, that seemed a very, that seemed plausible to me that it would be a fake. But it upset him greatly, I think, that, um, that, that people either didn't believe that it was a fake and didn't believe him, or that they didn't want to argue about it anymore. He wanted to continue the argument, and other people had just been fed up with it. When we saw him three weeks before his death, yeah. the riverbank came up. And we said, no, <laughs> no, let it rest, let it rest. But what I really oh, wow. admire about Jim is his, his daring to bring these contentious issues to the public attention. See, nobody else does that. The least hint of controversy, and most scholars just draw back into their ivory towers or whatever, and Jim never did that. He wasn't afraid of controversy, and he insisted on having his say, and I admire that. And he wanted it all out there. Those of us who were fortunate to be in his orbit, even a little, uh, were you know, warmed by the man and his vision. And through him, we were, were warmed by you know, centuries of art. Not just Chinese art, in my case, Japanese art, but, but all art, music, literature, uh, from ancient Chinese poets and painters to uh, E.M. Forster and others. It's not that he equates particular music with a particular art, but then he, that he's just wide open. And I can see the excitement that he has led in his life. He affected every, I mean, my musical taste, my literary taste, my everything that I love really comes from my father. I imagine I wouldn't have gone into academia if, it had, if I hadn't had him as a model. What I took from all of these um, opportunities that I had with him was how to become a very wonderful human being. I think he's left an indelible mark on the field, primarily for his writings. He just purely loved his subject area. You know, I'm sure to the last day of his life, he just wanted to know more about it, share more about it. He really believed that his immortality would reside in what he wrote. And that that's why I think he was so prolific in a sense, you know, that he was, he was very adamant at the end of his life when he couldn't really write any more actively using the keyboard himself. He wanted to do his video series because he said, there's so much in here, and he would point to his head, that I still haven't gotten out. And he wanted it all to be out there. It's as though he wanted to create this virtual, Im immortal self that would live on forever. And to a large extent, he succeeded, it seems to me. I don't know anyone who, who opened the field to more eyes and opinions and uh, exposed more types of pictures and had a wider ranging curiosity about everything. He was very willing to share his materials with students and with researchers and I think that that will be one of his lasting legacies is all of the people he inspired by what he gave them. You could always depend on him. Um, in every possible way. Whenever I got into difficulties with anything, I'd always phone him and say, help, you know, and he'd have some solutions. He wasn't getting smaller, he was actually getting bigger. And um, he therefore uh, gave us the liberty to do the same. And that I think was, you know, the greatest gift that he brought to his teaching here at Berkeley. I, I can't think of a better person to be able to teach 
um, those aspects of um, classical Chinese painting than him. 